Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word. We're going to take another special study today, as you see there at the bottom of the screen, Gardens of God. There were basically five of them that we know about from the manuscripts, and each time one came into being, it was a benchmark or a great change. So it's interesting. What about gardens? What, what is the word garden in the Hebrew tongue? It's gan, gan, G-A-N. And if you take it to the prime, it has basically one meaning, fenced. In other words, it's an area that is fenced for protection. Uh, he would tell us in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 9, in your garden, be very careful of what kind of seeds you plant by each other. You separate them. And, and this holds true to this day. There's some very good agricultural instructions in our Father's Word. As an example, if you plant cucumbers and cantaloupe side by side, you're going to have... Uh, what would you call them? Cantle cubes or something like that? They're going to mix. And they're really not fit to eat. So um, our Father created things as they are, and that's the way He wished to have them kept. So therefore, the fence. And in our garden, that is to say the garden of life, what is your fence? As it is written in many of the manuscripts, God is our fence. God is our wall. He is a wall between you and the enemy. That wall protects you against all things as long as you use common sense. And in utilizing common sense, then it's real easy to receive the blessings of God then because you are in His garden as long as you have His fence around you. I might, I might uh, test your memory just a little bit. Remember Job? What, what were Satan's words to God concerning Job? Oh, he said, I could get to him, but you have a wall around him. you got a fence around him. You won't let me at him. And then God removed that fence. Think about it. You'll find that recorded in Job chapter 1, verse 7, where Satan, along with the other angels, approached the throne of God and had that discussion, as well as the second chapter of Job, verses 1 and 2. So, gardens of God. When was the first garden? Well, we know, we know from uh, data and artifacts that this whole world was a garden as, as short a time as, say, 14,000 years ago. 14,000 years ago, carbon dated, we find mammoths in Alaska under the tundra that um, the meat still frozen on the bone. We find in Russia nine foot tusk uh, of mammoths. I mean, you know, we're talking about the tundra in Alaska that is a frozen waste. And some of them have buttercups in their mouth. We know from the deserts of Texas and Arizona that there were mammoths of which you're familiar with this tooth. Here you have the grinder. This is one tooth. This was a vegetarian that lived on lush pastures, the garden of God, this whole earth. But something happened. What was it? Well, let's go to our Father's Word, if we may, Jeremiah chapter 4. And let's try to understand what happened that caused God to destroy that earth age, that particular garden. I mean, each time that a garden changes, it's something really big. 
Okay, chapter 4, and we'll begin with verse 23. Uh, God had just said in verse 22, For my people is foolish, and they have not known me. They are sottish children. You know what sottish is? Stupid. They don't use their head. And then he says, verse 23, I beheld the earth. I looked at the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. In the Hebrew, this is tuhu v'abuhu, which is the same as Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, when God destroyed the earth. God did not create this earth void and without form. It rather became that way. Why? God destroyed the first age, earth age. He tells of it here. This is when that garden diminished. That one that we see, the mammoth and the dinosaur and many other species that lived on lush garden uh, type um, um, seasons. Verse 24, I beheld the mountains and lo, they trembled. They were perfect, but now they began to tremble. And all the hills moved lightly. There was shaking. I beheld and lo, there was no man. God destroyed man from earth. And all the birds of the heavens fled. You don't believe there was a man on earth? Gabriel means man of God. And you know this footprint that we received out of New Mexico, this human type, not human because it's over 10 million years old. It was these angelic beings that were on earth, an angel that could impregnate a woman. There is enough of a mass that it's going to leave a footprint in a lake area where they were bathing, swimming, or whatever the case might have been. But God removed them from this earth. He destroyed this earth age. Why? Because a third of his children followed Lucifer at his fall. Okay, and we continue then with the next verse. 26. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. And in other words, it was fruitful, but it became a wilderness. It was perfect, a garden, a paradise. But it became a wilderness, and all the cities, get that too, all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by His furious anger. A lot of people are slow enough that they think this was Noah's flood, but he didn't destroy every man during Noah's flood. And he's talking about and identifies it in the Hebrew in verse 23, Tuhu vavohu. 27, For thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full end. And he didn't. Rather, he created man, Adam, he created the other races. On the sixth day, rested a day, and then created Ha'adam on that eighth day. But what caused the, what caused the anger of our Father? Well, let's, let's go, if we may, to Ezekiel chapter 28. It's recorded at what it is that brought about His anger. And Ezekiel 28 is about Tyrus, the king of Tyre. Now, what is Tyre in the Hebrew tongue? It's rock, not our rock, but the fake rock. That is to say, Satan. It's simply one of his names, and you'll find that King Tyrus, as we're talking here, was not a human being, but a cherubim. Okay, and we'll pick it up in the 12th verse. This is why the garden became um, void, empty. Son of man, take up a lamentation. You sing this sad song upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You know, it, full of the, the full sum means our Father says, I created you with everything. You had it all. I, I can almost be a little jealous in a sense, and this is foolish talk, but I can almost be a little jealous because Satan had worked his way up by pleasing God to this position 
where evidently God was very pleased with him and gave him everything as he advanced. Verse 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden, I repeat, emphasize, garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, topaz, the diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, I'm going to read right on through, the emerald, carbuncle, gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes, as to say your drums, uh, were prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. He was not born. He was created. Verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub. Now you see who he is. The anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Right at the peak the pinnacle, the altar. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire, right on the fire of the altar. Do you understand the, do you understand when God instructed Moses and Moses created the um, ark and the mercy seat and placed the covering cherubs over it? Do you know, to cover means to protect. That was what his job was, to, was to protect the mercy seat. But rather than protect it, he wanted to sit on it. 15. Thou was perfect in thy ways. I mean, he did it all right. From the day that thou was created till, until iniquity was found in thee. What does that mean? He stopped loving God and began to love himself because he was so perfect in his own mind at this time. 16. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, your thoughts, your filthy, prideful thoughts. And thou hast sinned, therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. In other words, he downgraded Satan. He removed him from the office of protecting cherub. Not only that, 17, thine heart was lifted up. This, this in the Hebrew, pride. You were, you, you thought you were really something. Because of thy beauty, thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Your splendor, your magnificence. You know, think about the third that followed him as it is recorded in Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. He was splendid. I will cast thee to the ground. That means this earth, terra firma, erects. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, your sins, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore, will I bring forth, this is the death sentence upon Satan, I will bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. And to be turned to ashes is to be turned to ashes forever and ever and ever in the lake of fire, as it is written in Revelation chapter 20. Why then, back to the question, why would God destroy this first garden? He had a choice. He had to sentence this one to death. In other words, that's why he is known in other places by the title, Son of Perdition. Perdition of Palia, which is to say, the he that perishes. He that perishes forever and ever and ever. He's already sentenced to death. He's going to die. But you see, there is one thing that God either cannot or will not do. And that is, he will not force anyone to love him. Why? 
It wouldn't be natural. It wouldn't be real. Love must generate from within each entity. And God created each of the children, you, for his pleasure that you would love him. So, rather than at the same time of sentencing Satan, who led them off, drew a third of the children with his tail, so to speak, as it is written, a figure of speech, then God would have to have sentenced a third of his children to death also. These are my opinions. He chose rather than to destroy that first earth age and cause each soul to be born innocent of woman, destroyed that garden, and allow that child with no memory of what had happened, that soul. Where did your soul come from? God, of course. I think every Christian agrees with that. To either love him or this one, Mr. Death. Mr. Death because he's sentenced to death. Turn on with me, if you would, to the 31st chapter of this same book of uh, Genesis. We're going to talk about this same garden a little bit further as even he blends into the second garden. And even with that garden, there was a change of dispensation at the fall of Adam, at the fall of Eve. God here is talking to Pharaoh. Pharaoh thought, you know, Israel, when they should lean upon our father or expect him as the fence or the wall around their garden, they would always kind of run down to Pharaoh, play buddy-buddy. Naturally, that made God jealous because we were his children. So Pharaoh begins to talk, uh, rather God begins to talk to Pharaoh and said, hey, you think you're something, you should have seen, I could say Tyrus for the sake of saying, but here he's called Asha, which Asha has no um, article and uh, is not the subject. The word in the Hebrew, as is documented in the Masara, is Tiasha. Tiasha means a plain box cedar, not a cedar of Lebanon, which is symbolic of our people, meaning Satan. He said, I sentenced him to death, Pharaoh, so be careful. Basically, that's what is being said. Verse 2 of chapter 31, real quickly, let's go with it. Son of man, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitude. Whom art thou like in thy greatness? Who are you compared to that splendor one? That's kind of what he's saying. Three, behold the Assyrian. Again, the Assyrian or Asher has no article and... Um, the subject is not Assyria. It is T. Asha, that old box Seda, pretending to be something he isn't. Behold, the Syrian was a cedar in Lebanon, he claimed to be, with fair branches. Oh, he was splendid, all right. And with a shadowing shroud and of an high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs. He was really something. The waters made him great. Speaking of a garden, now think of it. The deep set him on high with her rivers uh, running round about his plants, the roots, and sent out her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. In other words, it was the watering, fertile, protected place. Uh, Therefore his height was exalted above all the trees of the field. He was the sharpest of all. Think about it. We're talking about Satan. It's very easy to document. And his boughs were multiplied. And his branches became long because of the multitude of waters when he shot forth. He took over. Six, all the fowls of heaven made their nest in his boughs. The little fallen angels, demonic spirits, and under his branches did all the beasts of the field bring forth their young. They admired him. And under his shadow dwelt all great nations. It will ultimately be one worldism. Seven, thou was, uh, thus was he fair in his greatness and the length of his branches, for his root was by great waters. Eight, 
the cedars of the garden of God. I repeat and emphasize, the cedars of the garden of God could not hide him. We're back in that garden. And the fir trees were not like his boughs. He was just different. Why? He's sentenced to death. He's named the dead. It is written in Hebrews chapter 2, verse uh, 12, that Christ came to this earth to die on the cross, whereby in so doing he would have the right to kill, destroy Satan, which is to say death. And the chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. God made him a dandy, sure did. A sign of jealousy? Well, he most likely was a very good servant to have earned that position at one time. Understand. Nine, I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches so that all the trees of Eden, that's paradise, that were in the garden of God envied him. This goes back now, we move to the second garden, which brought about sin and brought death into the world by death himself is to say, Tiasha, Satan, son of perdition, whatever name you wish to call him, dragon. It's just roles that he plays or titles that he uses to deceive people. Let me ask you something, has he deceived you? Or are you still in your Father's word, whereby you know where you stand? Verse 10, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast lifted up thyself in height. God did not lift him up. You got it? He lifted himself up. And he hath shot up his top among the thick boughs, and his heart is lifted up in his height. In other words, he was a, he was a proud rascal. I have therefore delivered him into the hand of the mighty one of the heathen. The heathen here is nations, okay? He shall surely deal with him. I have driven him out for his wickedness. And in so doing, beloved, that's why you never want to let Satan frighten you because when God drives him out of the garden of God, and garden means fence, and God is that fence, you have Satan on the outside of the fence looking in. And you have God for your protection. Thus it is written in Luke uh, chapter 10, verse 18, that cr through Christ we have power over all our enemies, including Mr. Death, which is to say Satan. Verse 12, and strangers... And strangers, um, the terrible of the nations, have cut him off and have left him up on the mountains and in all the valleys his branches are fallen and his boughs are broken by all the rivers. This is torrents here of the land and all the people of the earth are gone down from his shadow and have left him. That will come to pass. Upon his ruin... Shall all the fowls of the heaven remain, and all the beasts of the field shall be upon his branches. Uh, more subtle than all, even as it is written in Genesis 4.1. 14, to the end that none of all the trees by the waters, in the garden that is, exalt themselves for their height, neither shoot up their top among the thick boughs, neither their trees stand up in their height, all that drink water, for they are all delivered unto death to the nether parts of the earth in the midst of the children of men. This word men in the Hebrew is Adam, so that you know which garden we're talking about specifically in the manuscripts. With them that go down into the pit. In other words, those that follow him Inasmuch as in the 28th chapter, in that garden, he was sentenced to death. Hey, do you want a free ride? 
It's real easy to jump on his bandwagon and fly out of here. But you kind of come to a sudden stop when you realize where you're headed if you listen to the splendid one. 15, thus saith the Lord God in the day when he went down to the grave, the abyss, I caused a mourning. I covered the deep for him and I restrained the floods thereof and the great waters were stayed and I caused Lebanon to mourn for him and all the trees of the field fainted for him. I want you to picture, we're looking ahead here, this is future, that when the spurious Messiah falls, there will be people that will mourn for him. I cannot understand for the life of me how that could be at the end of the millennium. But it is written, and it shall be so. He must be something. What a deceiver when he is cast to the earth de facto, in person. 16, I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall when I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit. And all the trees of Eden, that garden, the choice and the best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth into the very womb of the earth, which is, goes back to the womb that brought each of us into this earth age. When it comes to its conclusion and the end of this age is consummated by these events, 17. They also went down into hell with him unto them that be slain with the sword. What sword? The word. And they that were his arm. This word arm in the Hebrew is his seed, the Kenites, that dwelt under his shadow in the midst of the heathen. Zerah. It's almost like Zawan, the tares in the Greek. Interesting, what? Well, I don't know. There's decisions to be made. And you'll be the one that makes the decision for yourself. And the word is very easy to follow. And I trust that you follow it. Now, God has been speaking to Pharaoh. He said, what do you think about Satan? He was really something and I brought him down and he's Mr. Death now. And he continues the subject now in the 18th verse back to Pharaoh. To whom art thou thus like in glory and in greatness among the trees of Eden? Pharaoh was just a human being. Yet shalt thou be brought down with the trees of Edom into the nether parts of the earth? Thou shalt lie in the midst of the uncircumcised with them that be slain by the sword. This is Pharaoh and all his multitude, saith the Lord God. So that's what happened to the first and the second garden. We could take it a little further. Let's, let's go to Genesis 2. Let's go to the second garden and then we'll leave the second garden and continue with the third in as much as there are five of them and that event, each time you change a garden, it's a benchmark. When the first garden ended, it was the Kabo, the Katabo, the, the overthrow of Satan and his being sentenced to death, the mighty one. Do not think for a moment there was not a time that God loved him dearly. That is obvious from the manuscripts. And then he turned on our father. Let's talk about this second garden. Genesis chapter 2 verse 8. We're just going to cover a couple of verses here. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward of Eden. Here it goes. Second garden. Another dispensation. And there he put the man whom he had formed. Not the one created, the one formed. Nine. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight. That means apple trees, orange trees, pretty trees, plum trees, and good for food. I mean, you can eat all you want from them. 
the tree of life also, that is to say Messiah, that is Christ, the tree of life, in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I want you to be, I know all of you should know this if you've studied with me any period of time. He, tree in the Hebrew tongue is etz. It comes from a prime, atash, which is to say the backbone, the trunk. These are the limbs. And the back is where the central nervous system is that attaches to the brain that gives you the knowledge of good and evil. You know when you're doing right and you know when you're doing wrong. And naturally Eve partook of that tree. But God placed that one, that tree of the knowledge of good and evil in that garden. Why? That's one of the reasons that I base the theory that this is a testing time. Are you, which are you going to love? The tree of life? or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I got news for you. The tree of life is spoken of in the last chapter of God's Word, Revelation chapter 22. But I assure you the tree of the knowledge of good and evil isn't because he will have been turned to ashes from within. To be turned to ashes from within, as we read in Ezekiel chapter 28, is a Hebraism that means fini. It's over forever and ever. This is why so many people confuse the terminology forever and ever. Ashes is forever and ever. Never again. That's the second garden. There was a third that we will get into in the very next lecture. It's called Gethsemane. Christ went into that garden and he was heavy of spirit. He was sad. Well, we'll start there. Let's do it. Let's do it. Go to Matthew chapter 26 with me. In the New Testament, go to Matthew 26. Christ was, he knew it was coming to that time there was a cup that was about to be placed in uh, place. And that cup was not his crucifixion, as many thought. But that cup is the cup of wrath that will be poured out upon this earth once again. Christ was hoping there was a way that could be avoided. For that is his very next how do I say this, de facto action on this earth in person. The Holy Spirit will be with us till that time, is to pour the wrath of God out on those. Um, and I just want to get a verse or two in it, and we'll take it up here in the next lecture. Verse 36 of Matthew 26, and it reads, Then cometh Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane. It's an oil press. Okay, for what kind of press? Olive oil, the anointing oil of our people. And saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. 37, and he took with him Peter and the two sons um, of Zebedee, uh, that's to say James and uh, that John, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. It was a sad time. And, he's, and then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. Let me ask you something. Do you watch with him? It's a one hour watch. Or do you fall asleep? We watch the prophecies of this great word. Yes, this was a garden, tears were shed. And some of his most prominent disciples were with him. And he's, watch with me. Do you know what they did? They fell asleep. Flesh is very weak. And that's why you must think spiritually. Think in the inner self, the inner man. 
when you concentrate on these five gardens of God. This gets us to the third garden. We have two more to go after we finish this one. Next lecture, hey, don't miss it. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. All right, bless your hearts. There we are back again. Let's have the 800 number if we may. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., including Alaska, Hawaii, and all over Canada. Hey, if the spirit moves and you have a question, share it, won't you? Now, those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's a pleasure having you with us. As always, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. You got a prayer request? You know what? He's your father, your nearest of kin. He created, he formed your very soul, yourself, and he loves you. If you have problems, talk to him about it, repent, and let him know you love him. Father, around the globe at this time, we come in this garden with you being our wall, Father. Look over, lead, guide, direct, touch, Heal in Yahshua's precious name. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's see what's on the minds of people from around the country. Trish from Florida. Where in the Bible does it say that Luke practiced his profession after he started following Christ? Well, now it doesn't say, and you've never heard me say that he practiced his profession. I have little doubt but what he did. You know, if you're a medical doctor, an MD, and you're walking along a road and someone's injured, well, you're certainly going to practice that. What you have heard me say is that inasmuch as Luke did a great deal of the scribe work for Paul even, that he leaves his uh, thumbprint in the scriptures because he uses medical terminology. Um, Let's take, let's take, uh, I'm trying to think of a place. There are many. He mentions like a break, like a, a fracture of the tibia or a radius. He mentions in Luke chapter 16, here's a good place, for example. In Luke 16, in what is it, about verse 26, where he speaks of that gulf in the parable between the rich man and Lazarus in heaven, in the paradise, he calls it in the Greek kashma, which is, is the equivalent of the English chasma, which means it gaps open, like a wound that gaps open. All right, It's a medical term. And, and you can just spot Luke's uh, authorship because he uses some... Well, let's just simplify it by saying he talks like a doctor and he writes like one, all right? Real simple. Uh, but to say, the, the scriptures don't say that he practiced it anymore. But anytime you are trained in something and there is a need and you're a good person, you're going to do it, all right? Um, Dan from Minnesota. I'm taking a martial art course and uh, their beliefs, uh, is it okay for me to go ahead and take the course as long as I know I'm Christian and their religion doesn't bother me? Well, no, it, Christians can go anywhere they want to. We don't have to be afraid of anything. And uh, you filter. That filter. A filter is what we term discernment. 
And hey, pick up the good and put out the bad, all right? Uh, Christians are not stuck up, one way, uh, afraid to touch someone uh, type people. Because we have a wall. We can go wherever we want to using common sense, all right? Uh, Deborah from Tennessee. I told someone that had a daughter on drugs to talk to the man upstairs. Is it okay to address God as the man upstairs? It's, it's a figure of speech, and it, it, does, it wouldn't offend him, uh, especially when you're talking um, to a person that may not be perhaps a well-founded Christian. That is, that is colloquialism that they understand, and communicating is planting seeds. No problem. Catherine from Michigan. Why do you say Jerusalem is God's favorite place? That's, that's real simple. In Ezekiel chapter 16, it stipulates. It's, it's a very touching chapter concerning our Father in Jerusalem. And perhaps it can make you better understand how that in Matthew 23 that Jesus would say with almost tears in his eyes, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How often I would have taken you as a mother hen does her chicks. In other words, there's a great love there. But it comes forth because God describes Jerusalem as a little baby girl that is born to a heathen family that did not know the cleanliness of how a birth should be handled. And he described why. Because the Jebusites formed Jerusalem, and they called the city Jebus. That was Jerusalem's original name, Jebus. And it was born unclean. I mean, there was the Jebusites, there was not, oh well, I, you know, they were heathen, just like that, barbarians. And then she grows, to, she, God takes her and swaddles her, cleans the, the unclean birth up, and as she matures and womanhood begins to form, uh, and I need not, I mean, it goes even down to the graphics of, of as the hairs of maturity form upon her, then he falls in love with her. I'm talking about the manuscripts. It's very touching. And he falls in love with her and takes her to wife. And this is an analogy of God taking to wife this, this uh, girl at maturity, only it's the city. It's his favorite place. And not only that, but in that 16th chapter, God makes an eternal, everlasting covenant with that city, that geographical location, Mount Zion. That's where heaven will be on earth. That's why the temple and, and God's abode on earth is described in a 1,500-mile cube because it goes out as well as upon. Okay, Clarence from Ezekiel 16. All right, it's real simple. Clarence from Florida. Does the resurrection take place when a person dies? The word resurrection, as it is used in the, in the English translation, the King James, has three meanings. And uh, one meaning is simply to uh, stand up for Christ. That resurrects you to a higher level of thinking, spiritually and otherwise. The second meaning is to return morally to the truth. Then you are also resurrected and raised to a higher level of thinking. And the third is to put off the flesh and to put off the flesh is to be with God. Yes, is the answer to your question. It takes place for an entity there. That's why Paul would say in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 in, in verse 15 and 16 that, and 17 that we that are alive cannot precede the dead. Why? They're already there. That was the subject from verse 13. Donna from Illinois. 
Why did Jesus say, I go to prepare a place for you when we know it is here on earth where he will come to be with us? What was he preparing? Well, what did he say? And you're quoting from John chapter 14. I go to prepare a mansion. But what is that word in the Greek? Minu. It, it means not as we think in the English of a mansion. Oh yes, got a big yard. Got uh, servants and, you know, four car garage, big mansion. No, that's not what it's talking about. It's a resting place. And the Holy Spirit was that resting place. Because if you continue reading, the Holy Spirit comes to do what? Minno, abide in you, rest in you, giving you rest and peace of mind. That's what he prepared. And he's everywhere. That's why his name is Yahweh. I am that I am. He's wherever he wants to be, all right? Um, Ruth from, and you're never alone. Ruth from South Carolina. If a person curses God or says that he is a liar, and I assume you mean God's a liar, does this person still have a chance to repent and be saved? Of course. I think probably what would help you, Ruth, is if you covered Luke chapter 12, verse 10, which describes the unforgivable sin. The unforgivable sin is to deny or blaspheme the Holy Spirit when you are delivered up before Antichrist, the synagogue of Satan. Christ said, you can say whatever you want to me about me as the man that walked the earth or even the Father, uh, but unforgivable. If you do that when you know better, when you know that this is the false Messiah you're being delivered to, and you do not allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you to accomplish what our Father's plan is for his election, okay? Now, you repent or you tell whoever it is uh, to repent and God will forgive them. He certainly will. I know there would be many ministers that would disagree with me on that, but if they want to disagree with the word, that's something else because that's exactly what the word says. Let them argue with the word. I'll tell you who is right. The word is right. Uh, Kay from North Carolina. My priest said Christians should forgive Satan. What do you think about this? It's a little late to forgive him. He's already dead. That is to say he's sentenced to death. What, what would forgiving him, what purpose would that serve? Besides, as it is written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse what? 7, 8, something more along there. It says, if a brother walks disorderly, separate yourself from him, all right? And, and uh, correct him. I mean, tell him what you think about him. Uh, you don't, I, I don't know why. I, I know that we have this teaching of all things are reconciled. Hey, it's too late to teach reconciliation for Satan. And a lot of people, because of their ignorance of the Greek, are misinformed as far as to the in-depth meaning of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, where it is recorded, And marvel not, for even Satan is transformed into an angel of light. That's what they teach. That's kind of what the King James says. But do you know what the Greek says concerning deception and the false messiah? being seduced as Eve was in the garden, verse 3 of chapter 11, beguiled, uh, expatio in the Greek, which means wholly seduced, which is the act of losing her virginity in the spiritual sense as far as waiting for the true Messiah. But it states, don't marvel because of all the deception or what preachers say, super preachers, Paul calls them, for Satan himself will come disguised, I repeat, not transformed, disguised 
as an angel of truth or the angel of truth, but I tell you he's the angel of the prince of the air, still old Satan. I'm not forgiving him. Neither is the father, for he's already sentenced to death. And look at the harm that he has done to our people. Pam from Indiana. Is there any place in the Bible that states why God made the earth and all the people in it when he knew that it was going to turn out so bad in the first place? This has been bothering me and I can't find anything in the scriptures about this. Please comment. I enjoy your teaching also. Well, thank you, Pam, for enjoying it. But honey, I want you to read the end of the book. It does turn out good. It turns out beautiful. It turns out wonderful. And it can be wonderful for you today if you're behind the fence in the garden. Don't live in the world. I mean, we must live in the world, but stay behind the fence. And it all turns out good. All things. I'm going to quote from Romans chapter 8 for you, and I don't want you to ever forget this. All things work to the good for those that love the Lord. Well, how can that be? When you believe that and have the faith to know that and stay behind the fence using common sense, it's very true. God blesses everything you touch. And if any trouble comes along, he makes you so strong that it's just good exercise before breakfast to take care of problems, big ones, and put them down, all right? Stephen from Illinois, what do you think about the theory of evolution? It's as phony, it's as phony as a $3 bill. And anyone that teaches evolution is absolutely ignorant. And I don't mind calling them ignorant, because they are. You know, uh, look at the footprint, 10 million years old. It's exactly the same as a, a footprint is today. And you know, I dig a lot and, and work in archeology span and uh, paleontology, uh, many things, and you know, I can go out here and dig out from, from the surface, and what do you know? There's a snail. Well, that snail is 50 million years old, and you know what? It looks exactly like a snail today. And they find the little jawbone here, you know, um, Leaky or whatever his name is, little jawbone. Oh, hey, we've, we've discovered the missing link. This is man's little bridge from time past, and with their intelligence, you know, they put it all together, and, and they put a face on it, and you know what? It looks like an ape. You know why? It is an ape. For evolution to be a fact, it would have to be, as creation was, an unending, an unending event. In other words, you would have to at all times find various animals in different states from the amoeba. All, in other words, it would have to continue to happen. It would have to be happening today, evolution. Only an idiot, only someone ignorant would, could not see through that folly, okay? I know that may offend some people, but I could really care less. It's the truth. Anybody that would believe in evolution when, when, when everything is as it always has been, there is nothing new under the sun, is ignorant if they believe things evolve. Our, our Father created our wonderful bodies, I guess they're wonderful, um, in such a way that they do adapt to certain conditions. It's kind of amazing. I mean, like to temperatures, we adapt to temperatures. You, you move from the north to the south and your blood thickens or thins or whatever the case. That's what I think about evolution. I feel sorry for people that can be duped. And there are a lot of really intelligent people that are ignorant as far as evolution is concerned. Uh, and yet, you know what, this, this, while I'm on this, I'm, I'm a, in, in the various universities and colleges that I travel to and work with, credentials, you know? I mean, 
I'm an intelligent being and I can see that couldn't be, but I have to worry about my credentials. That if I were to speak out against evolution, after all, I'm speaking as some prop speak, professor speak, okay? My credentials. Hey, um, I think your credentials are strengthened when you tell the truth, all right? When you're brave, when you stand out like Dr. Fell stood out, when you speak truth and document it, that's what truth is. Okay, I'm glad I got that out of my I'm glad you asked that question, Steve. It just, I don't know why, it just made me feel good all over to give my thoughts on the theory of evolution. Uh, Leland from Virginia, I'm 59 years old, been to several churches. I've received more understanding from you in three months than ever. Can you explain hell to me? Well, thank you for the, God's word is what does it, Leland. It's not this man, it's God's word. When it's taught, then it just really makes a difference. I want you to take your Strong's Concordance and I want you to take the word hell and I want you to find the three main reasons. There's one, three main names that are translated into the English hell. There are actually four, but there's one that is just a living, it's, it's called Tartarus, which is the place of the fallen angels. But it means grave and that's all, okay? So well, the grave, the supplica, it means the place that the flesh goes. Now the lake of fire, that's different. It also means Gehenna, which is the garbage pit that burns night and day outside of Jerusalem. God, Christ used that as an analogy. Hey, I'm out of time again. Seems like this hour just flies by. I love you all, but what's more important, God loves you because you listen to his word, because you enjoy studying his word. That makes his day. And when you tell him you love him and make his day, he's going to bless you. You can have faith in that. This is the most important thing, though. And it's this, that you stay in his word every day in his word's good day. Know why? Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.